Uh, Madam Comrade President, <laughs> comrades, the implication of this motion before us is that this union has been dreaming the American dream up to the present day, but is now considering whether to kick the habit. If so, it's about time, because anyone who still dreams the American dream must either be fast asleep or high on drugs. <laughs> the American dream became one of the great myths of the 20th century. It has been assiduously promoted by the multi-millionaires whose fortunes have been made or more often inherited in a system based on exploitation, discrimination and inequality. The myth makers who own most of the mass media in the United States must keep everyone on the treadmill, trudging after that bunch of carrots being dangled before them. The multi-billionaires, of course, have shedfuls of carrots, many of which they'd rather let rot than share with those who actually labour to produce them. The reality is that for the second half of the 20th century and into the 21st, according to the OECD, the USA is one of the most unequal societies in the world. The wealthiest 1% of the population own one third of all the country's personal wealth and more than 50% of the stocks and shares. The wealthiest 10% own more than two-thirds of all the wealth. The poorer one-half of the American people own just 2.5% of the country's wealth and 0.5% of the stocks and shares. More than 20% of US children are officially classified as living in poverty, twice the level of those in Britain or France. The average company chief executive takes home 343 times as much money as the average American worker. And for decades, the gulf has been widening. None of these figures, by the way, are seriously in dispute. Indeed, because the wealthy hide so much of their wealth, they probably underestimate the extent of inequality in real America. In real world America, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, the value of wages has not increased in 50 years. One hour's work today will buy you no more for your dollars than it would have done in 1962. Where has all the productivity gone? Well, you're bright people, I think you can work it out. The hard-working American family is not a myth, but the idea that they reap even a small share of the fruits of their labor, that's the myth, sustained by the American dream. Because a dream is all it will ever be for most people in a ruthless system dominated, distorted, and corrupted by giant monopoly corporations, a factor which has been entirely absent from all the speeches you've heard on the other side so far. So far. A system, by the way, in which corporate fat cats preach the virtues of free enterprise, standing on your own two feet, while the US public underwrite a $21 trillion bailout of that system's giant corporations and markets. That's, by the way, what US governments spend on federal welfare programs in the course of 50 years. The real cost of college tuition in the United States is five times higher today than it was in 1978. The average cost of tuition fees, room and board at America's private universities has risen to $37,000 a year 
That's more than £23,000. Meanwhile, 17 million graduates are doing jobs that don't require a college degree. And McDonald's now turn away a higher percentage of applicants than Harvard University. <laughs> Healthcare costs currently account for 16% of the average household spending in the United States, more than three times the cost of paying for the NHS in Britain. More than one third of working age Americans are struggling to pay their medical bills or their medical debts. But here's the beauty of the American dream for the private healthcare profiteers. The billionaire mass media has convinced a substantial proportion of the US population that even a statutory medical insurance system is a, is a symbol of socialist tyranny. Britain's NHS must be full-blown communism. This is an example of how big business and right-wing fanatics, the biggest proponents of the American dream, by the way, not the very pleasant, nice, civilised uh, speakers that we've heard, they're completely unrepresentative of the main propagandists of the American dream. This is an example of how big business and right-wing fanatics have debased the whole currency of political debate in the USA. But the corruption runs far deeper. No candidate can hope to become president unless he or she is either a multimillionaire or relies upon corporate sponsorship. Exceptions to this rule are rare even in the US Congress. No wonder that only 28% of adult Americans voted for the winning candidate in last year's presidential election. 44% of them either could not vote or would not vote at all. Perhaps they've rumbled the fact that the US is actually a one-party state run by two parties, both committed to the interests of big business at home and abroad, and both forever pumping out this blamange about the American dream. By the way, best not to mention the American dream to the peoples of Iraq, Afghanistan, Panama, Cuba, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, the Dominican Republic, Greece, countries where US military intervention has killed more than five million of their citizens since 1945. And let's not forget that defending and promoting the American dream was also a major pretext for installing and sustaining military dictators with their torturers and their death squads across large parts of the third world for much of the 20th century. Comrades, perhaps some of you are by now. <laughs> Reality itself is what is killing the American dream. With some, of, with some of the highest crime rates in the world and among the lowest rates of upward social mobility in the world, many, many of America's own citizens have stopped believing in fairy tales. Most black and native Americans, by the way, never swallowed the myths in the first place. Many millions of US citizens know that in a system dominated by corporate liars and crooks, hard work does not guarantee a safe family, a secure home, a decent job, or retirement in dignity. But building a system which does, that requires fresh and courageous vision, not the regurgitation of threadbare cliches from the past. Madam Comrade President, I'd like to end, not with a quote from Marx or Lenin, but one from the first book of Corinthians, chapter 13, verse 11, with apologies for the sexism. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
This union can show its solidarity with the struggles and aspirations of the decent, hard-working majority of Americans by voting down the childish, deluded, discredited proposition now in front of it.